What do camouflage and clerics have in common? We'll talk about that tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Before we do that, I want to mention two saints that we have today. One is Saint Jerome Emiliani, who did a lot of work of taking care of orphans and abandoned children, of which there were plenty in the uh, early 1500s. There were a series of wars in Italy and naturally lots of orphans. So he did a lot of work with that, depending on God's providence. But then we have a newer saint today that we also celebrate, Saint Josephine Bajita. She was born in 1869 and died in 1947. She had been captured as a slave in her home, I believe in Sudan, and she was sold to various people and eventually sold to an Italian man, an atheist himself, uh, who had no religious concern and apparently no concern for human dignity. He brought her as a slave to Italy, where slavery was already illegal. And eventually, with the help of the local priest and other uh, and some religious and the daughter of this man, who was a believer, uh, she was given her freedom, much to his chagrin. She was just decreed, I think today, as the patroness of people who are involved in human trafficking. This is the sale of people as slaves. And it's appropriate that they have their feast together because a lot of these human slaves that are being trafficked are abandoned children. Children been, are born out of wedlock and tossed on the streets in a variety of countries around the world. And it's important because there are more slaves today than there ever were in the 17 or 1800s. But they're not working in cotton fields anymore. They're working between cotton sheets in brothels especially in China and India and other countries. And we need to, uh, I just met some sisters who are working to give a home for the ones that get liberated. And, uh, the, and that's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They're all over our country too. So pray for those people. And St. Bajita and St. Jerome Emiliani are great patrons for us to seek that and do what we can to help. All right, let's turn to our guest, whom you might spot tonight walking down some street in army camouflage or in his black clerical collar. Just happens, it just depends on the assignment that he has that day. He's a Catholic priest and a chaplain with the rank of lieutenant colonel in the Nebraska Army National Guard. And when he's not counseling soldiers on the battlefields of Iraq or Afghanistan, he's counseling and training future priests at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary to effectively fulfill their mission for souls in the day-to-day -day life of their local parishes. So please welcome Father Brian Kane. Father? Colonel? Good to be here. <laughs> Good to have you here. Good to have you here. Welcome, welcome. How long have you been in the National Guard? I had the privilege of joining three years after I was ordained a priest in 2003. All right. So you were ordained in 2000 That's then, correct. And you signed up in 2003. Yes. And, you know, uh, of course, you enter the military as an officer and uh, when you're a, a chaplain. 
and depending on the kind of degree, the level of officer, right. and now you've risen from what? You start off as Begin a as lieutenant? As a Captain. lieutenant, first lieutenant. Yeah, I call it lieutenant. If you have a, by the way, any of you PhDs that want to join, you get to be a captain right away. That's right. <laughs> and uh, 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 so from lieutenant, you've uh, worked up the ranks to lieutenant colonel. Congratulations. Thank you. It's great service. Have you gone over to Iraq and uh, Afghanistan? I did. I had the privilege of serving in Iraq in 2005 mm -hmm. and then returned again for a year in 2010. Yeah. And both were opportunities of, of amazing grace to be able to serve as a priest and mm -hmm. to be able to bring the presence of Jesus in the midst of a combat zone to people who are really struggling and being away from their family, facing death, facing all kinds of difficulties. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, you have to watch some of the more recent movies that have been done. That's often those are very realistic uh, presentations of how tense and difficult and dangerous that is. And, the, these, uh, the military in these uh, countries undergo tremendous stress from a variety of issues that you, you brought up. It's, it's really difficult. Yeah, it's something that I don't think we, we think about that often. Oftentimes, our war, we're kind of detached from that. In fact, it was, it was people commented that we could go about our day and not realize that there were thousands and thousands of Americans deployed around the world, including a, a, a Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and, and we wouldn't even know. But, no. but they experience great spiritual difficulties as well as the sacrifice of being away from their families and, and the challenges of war. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, what would you say would be the main spiritual challenge for them? You know, I think it is the, the difficulty of trying to comprehend why does evil exist in such a way, you know, that they're, they're, they're brought in there to try to overcome uh, the challenges that are there and just trying to figure out where is God in the midst of this? You know, where, where is he? And they usually, they embark on a search and people are, a lot of times are very interested to learn more about faith and to deepen their faith while they're there. While we were deployed, we had two RCIA classes going at the same time in different bases for, for soldiers, men and women and civilian contractors who wanted to learn more about the church, to join the church, to be baptized, mm -hmm. to have their marriages validated in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And there's, in a sense, a kind of a spiritual awakening that took place in, yeah. in the desert. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it's, uh, I've also met a number of men who just feel the absence of God mm -hmm. very strongly when they're there because they're, they're fighting, you know, sometimes horrendous situations where children are employed and used as, as tools by uh, various folks and innocents are blown up. So it, it's difficult. difficult. It is, and, and it's one of the things that, that the, the, the government recognizes, there's the need for spiritual care for people who are deployed in a combat zone. And so the, the, the government, the military, puts a lot of resources into training chaplains from a vari wide variety of faith backgrounds yes. to be able to enter into combat, to train with them, to prepare with them and then to accompany them and in a sense shepherd them through those difficulties and try to bring them back, you know, as whole as possible, you know, yeah. and, and sometimes even spiritually better off than when they left. Because, and, and this is important because it, it's great discipline to be in the military. And as chaplains, you have to share in that discipline without going off into combat. You're not allowed to do that. but other aspects of the discipline that are necessary for life uh, uh, and for your friends, that's some, one of the things I'm sure you picked up a lot in your training as a chaplain. Chaplains go through the same training as any other soldier in the military, any other member of the military, except weapons training. So we're non-combatants. So that means we don't carry a weapon. We have a chaplain assistant who accompanies us, who is armed into, into the different parts of, of the combat zone. And the training, I think, is good for chaplains to be able to experience because we do, you learn discipline, you learn teamwork, you learn leadership, you learn how to uh, take the skills you learned and, as, and, and function as a priest and to bring them into a, a military setting, into a combat setting. And there's a lot, of, a lot of positive aspects that the soldiers have a deep respect for the chaplains who have gone through the same training as they have. And, mm -hmm. and, and the, we know what it's like. We're, we're ready to accompany each other into battle. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, in addition to that, you're also the Dean of Men at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary. Um, is there any overlap <laughs> between these two worlds? There, there is. It's, it's, I think it's a providential thing, and it's a, it's a blessing for me to be able to return to St. Charles, where I studied for six years. As a matter of fact, you studied with two of our friars, did, I did you not? I did, yes. Father Anthony and Father Mark were there, and so mm -hmm. uh, we, we got to enjoy our time together at St. Charles. And so mm -hmm. it's a blessing for me to be able to go back there to work with some of my classmates uh, who have also returned to the seminary. And, you know, a, a staff. A, a staff, yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. right. They didn't f flunk. That's right. No, they're, they're doing well. And to actually be able to see where does military training and seminary formation overlap. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it might look, as, it look like, or people might think about it as the seminary does things similar to what the military does. But I think the church has been doing this a lot longer than the military. And I think that the church is really being imitated by a lot of other groups in, in terms of the way that we form leaders and, and people ready to go into battle. Mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting, the army values uh, follow an acronym of leadership, which is loyalty, duty, respect, uh, selfless service, mm -hmm. integrity, uh, um, and um, um, personal courage. Mm -hmm. you know, so those are things that we need in a, in a, in a priest. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's very interesting to see how they overlap. Yeah, yeah. So what do you see then, you know, as, as you're, you're forming these young men for the priesthood, um, and you have to say, all right, drop and give me 50. <laughs> I actually do joke with them about that every once in a while. <laughs> they owe me joke some only. Uh, yeah, joke. yeah, yeah. They, they owe me some push-ups. Uh, but the, I think that the the understanding of, of discipline. You know that that there's a discipline. For example, when you're in the, in the military, we spent time polishing our boots. We, the, the soldiers spend time learning how to clean, assemble, and disassemble their weapon. We 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 do all those small things. You learn how to march and to walk in step and, and, and to, to support each other. You, learn, you show up early for things, you, all those different things that the thought is in military training, if it's done and you do small things well, then you can be entrusted with, with greater things. And the church sees obviously the same thing. It's a, it's a scriptural understanding that if young men learn that discipline of being able to work together, of the ability to study and to pray and to put real work in identifying what their weaknesses are so that they can grow and learn from those, then we're going to have holy, happy, healthy priests, you know, who are able to go out and minister and to go into battle, you know, in, in the different ways that, that the world needs them today. Yeah. I, I, I boasted that for uh, my first, uh, well, let's say, uh, well, 20 years in the Jesuits, the highest uh, position of responsibility I ever had was as the prince of the novitiate. Mm-hmm. That means I was in charge of cleaning the throne room, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know that that. But that's part of you know, you know doing that kind of chore is, is part of what we do, you know, and that's part of it, it preparing for priesthood. Right. The other thing that's interesting is that the, the the military brings together a large and diverse group of people, and they help them to learn to come from all their different backgrounds to work together as one and. What I've seen at St. Charles is very similar. We have seminarians from 11 different dioceses, from five different religious orders. We have 160 men there who are being brought together in the midst of their diversity into one so that they can then go out, not only throughout the United States, but also overseas. We have seminarians from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh. We have seminarians who are Vietnamese, who are from Nigeria, a large group of Hispanic seminarians who are there. And to learn about those differences, to be able to work together, to, to slowly help form young men to be shepherds and to go out and to, to help build bridges, you know, to cooperate with God and, and building bridges and, and, and bringing people closer to Jesus. And certainly part of this training, is, uh, there's, uh, I went through the exhortation on priesthood from Pope St. John Paul. Mm -hmm. And he talks about uh, the importance not only of spiritual and theological training, but also the human training and pastoral training. 
that he wanted those four legs to be part mm -hmm. of what seminaries did. This sounds like you're, you, that, that what you bring from your experience in the military is kind of focused on that human person training, or the, the human qualities that these young men need to develop. That, that's true, and the, the newest document actually that just came out in December, guide, continuing to guide the church on priestly formation, identifies the first of those four dimensions of formation as the human formation is what everything else is built upon. So if we have a young man who is able to, through maturity, interact with anybody, you know, to, to be able to handle his emotions, to be able to uh, work in the midst of difficulty and pressure, uh, if we have somebody who's able to be transparent, to be able to ask each other for help, support each other, to be able to seek assistance when he knows he can't do it by himself, to, mm -hmm. to, to not enter into parish life or priest life as kind of the lone ranger, of, I'm going to do this by myself, but to enter into it in the midst of a group of, of brother priests that you're, you're, you're entering and, and doing this together and you're learning together. If we can, if we can build that, then we're going to be able to in a much more effective way than help them to be able to pray and to deepen their life of prayer, to be holy priests. To, to if, if, if those things are worked on, then, then the other things uh, fit right into that. And so mm -hmm. the seminary community with all the priests and the lay people are, who are there kind of all work on that together. And, and each week we sit down and, and we, we, we talk about how are the guys doing? You know, is there, is there an area we could especially help them to focus on? Is there an area that's going to help them to be a better priest, and it's it's an enjoyable thing, you know, to to be able to sit and to work with them. They're such quality men, you know, who have, in a sense, decided that the blueprint for their life that they might have thought that they were going to follow, they're willing to give up for God's blueprint and God's plan, mm -hmm. and and that's a great gift of self. That idea of selfless service, you know, they're the moment they walk in the seminary, they're they're putting that blueprint aside, and and they're men who aren't just like entering the seminary because they don't have anything better to do. You know, there, there are men entering the seminary who are giving up the a, ability to be a doctor, you know, to be lawyers, to, to be very successful in the world. Some of them already have that, degrees. Right, right. Uh, a few have advanced degrees, and uh, usually they have a basic bachelor degree. Wouldn't that be the case? Right, yes, they and have so, to, right. Uh, they, so they've thought about other careers quite frequently, and yet the attraction to priesthood you know obviously brings them to the seminary and they follow that vocation yeah and that is not the easiest thing you know that that one of the other blessings that we see is the the support from family you know the support from friends i, I know that's a huge blessing in my life and the support from their pastors and and other priests to to encourage them and a lot of times I think they'll identify the fact that there is a priest in their life who is joyful. There's a priest in their life who they said, you know what, I think I want to be kind of like him. I think mm -hmm. I can do that. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so th that's one of the blessings, you know, as people are thinking about how do we encourage vocations, how do we promote that, is just helping them to see that, that there is there's a great joy in being a good and a holy priest. Yeah, yeah, and it's, uh, uh, again, this human element is a foundation upon which the spiritual and pastoral and intellectual get built. And sure, a foundation is down in the dirt. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very, and a lot of it's hidden, but it's absolutely necessary for the whole structure not to sink. Yeah, we, we ha one, of, one of the parts of basic training is going through the gas chamber. You know, you go through this, this chamber filled with tear gas and you enter with a face mask and you go in there, and once it's full of this tear gas, you take off the mask, and they have you experience what it's like to be in the midst of that, that gas, you know, and that, mm -hmm. that difficulty. And you walk out of there with a greater confidence in your ability to do that. You walk out of there with a confidence in the equipment that you're issued, knowing that if I breathe through this, it's going to keep me safe. And you also walk out of there with a camaraderie that you didn't have before. And mm -hmm. I think the seminary does a lot of the same things. You, you enter into a challenging thing. You know, it's hard trying to balance your studies and your prayer life and the opportunity to, to exercise and to have, you know, a good balanced social life. Uh, it's hard to balance all those things. The guys talk to me about that all the time is how do I, how do, I do that? Some things are more measurable than others. You know, academics are easy. You, you've got a Get grade. Grades, but, yeah. but how do you figure out, you know, there's no grade for human formation. But 
they, they come together. And that's, that's one of the other things is that, that support. Uh, we encourage the guys to belong to a small group, to, to get together, to pray together, to support each other. And that same thing happens when you go through basic training is that group that walks out of that, that, that gas chamber is a closer group and they are more prepared to trust each other and to go into battle or to do whatever difficult thing it is that they're being asked to do. See, and this, this is something, uh, at, at times, folks outside the view, purview of what a real seminary is like will say, oh, this is sort of a safety zone. It's kind of an easier way to go. And, you know, the guys don't have the same challenges I do. So this is for the guys who can't take mm -hmm. real life. You, you hear that. Do you find that to be the kind of guy that gets attracted to the seminary? I, I think today, you know, if you look at society, it's daunting, you know, to look at where is the world in terms of faith, what's going on in the world. It's a daunting place to try to enter into, but it's also an exciting time to be in the church because you have young men and also young women who are discerning religious life who want to engage that. To, you know, we talk about the new evangelization, you know, they, they want to be a part of that. And it's not an easy thing. If, if a young man goes to the seminary of high school, it's four years of undergraduate study. And then in some places there's a spiritual year. It's one of the things we have at St. Charles where mm -hmm. they spend a year, they do a media fast. So there's no technology. They do a commerce fast. They're not purchasing anything during that time. They're spending time developing their spiritual life. They're working with the poor. So that, that year is in the middle. And then four more years of graduate study in theology and pastoral approach. They, during those years, they go out and they work in parishes. They work in prisons and nursing homes, hospitals. So it's an intense nine years of formation that prepares them to go out and, and to be priests. So it is in, not for the faint of heart. It's not for the faint of heart, and it's not for the overly dependent personality no. either. No, you, you, you've got to be somebody who, and this is one of the things we help them with, you know, is to be confident in who God made you and the talents that God has given to you, and then to be able to be docile to formation. That's the other thing is, you know, if, if you look at basic training, if somebody goes in and thinks that they know everything, then they are very much at risk when they go into a combat zone because they weren't listening and they weren't learning from the people mm -hmm. who, who the military puts there to help train them. The same thing is true in the seminaries. It takes, and this is one of the virtues I really encourage them to grow in, it takes humility to admit the fact that I don't know everything and that I'm going to trust the people that the church has put in my path people in the seminary, the priests who are there, the lay people, but then also family members and friends and other people, I'm going to trust that those people are going to help form me in the areas where I know I need some help. And that's what we try to work for at St. Charles is, is encouraging a trusting relationship. So we have a whole group of priests that, that are there full time as formators and they meet, the seminarians meet with the priests on a frequent basis, three every three or four weeks. And we, we build that trust. We help them to be transparent in the, in the things that they know they need help with. They then also have a spiritual director that helps them to grow in that way. And so it, it becomes an intense opportunity for them to be formed as long as they're willing to be formed. Yeah, it, it's very important for, to, to see what that formation is like because I think there's another crisis going on well, among a variety of issues going on in our culture. Um, they, they talk about helicopter parents mm -hmm. who are hovering over their kids in overly protective ways. And they, uh, just a study was, it was on the news earlier today. It just came out saying that a lot of the people who are uh, unable, and we see them on college campuses, they can't tolerate diverse opinions mm -hmm. anymore. And a variety of other people who are just angry and all, they're also showing up to be very dependent. Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to live on their own. And I wonder if their uh, snowflake anger modes are not related to the fact that they're angry at themselves mm -hmm. for being incapable of being truly independent. Whereas you're preparing these guys like the military is preparing soldiers to be this odd combination of independent and yet working together as a team. You know, this is so that's a very American characteristic in our military, but it's it's teamwork 
an independence, you know, uh, that at the same time. It's a fascinating combination, and it works when it's done. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not, it, I think it's one of the blessings that, that there is time and formation for men to slowly grow in those areas, you know, that we have, we have a priest who's trained as a counselor who's there on the staff, you know, who he also is there to help them grow in those different areas. You know, Bishop Senior talks a lot about, you know, being able to be comfortable, like you said, in diverse settings, diverse situations with diverse groups of people. He, he's, he's the rector at the seminary. And, and to be able to be comfortable in those areas. Pope Francis talks about being comfortable living in the gray, you know, mm -hmm. that sometimes we like, we like that black and white, but a lot of times the priesthood is living in the gray and, and figuring out and discerning where is this person, where are we trying to get them, and how do we get them to that point in terms of their relationship with Jesus, but being comfortable. You know, Father Newhouse says that the church always, or the church never imposes, but always proposes, you know, and, and I think we're trying to figure out a way to help priests, seminarians to do that in a joyful way, and in, in a compelling way, uh, in a way that's attractive. Yeah, yeah, and it's, uh, it, 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 it's certainly, that, that attractiveness and joy have to come from an authenticity that is grounded in their relationship with Christ. Who um, they're there again because they know Christ called them. This is not just oh, it's a good job career. If you think this is a good job opportunity, right? Yeah, <laughs> then you're so stupid. You shouldn't be in the seminary. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, it's one of the things also, you know, if, if you think about it, somebody who enters the military is ready to lay down their life. Yes. And, and a young man who is following God's call to the priesthood is preparing to do the same exact thing. Yes. And that is not an easy thing, you know, which is why the military puts a lot of resources into helping people be prepared to do that. And the church does the same thing. There's an immense amount of resources that goes into forming priests, w whether it's priest personnel, the religious sisters who work at the seminary, the lay people who are there, all the support from, from in our case, the archdiocese and, mm -hmm. and many other places. And um, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing undertaking. I think uh, it's, it's a gift that the church gives to the people now and, and in the future. Yeah. We're going to take a break. I uh, want to get back with your questions and comments. But if you would like more information about St. Charles Borromeo Seminary, uh, go to their website, which is SCS, stands for St. Charles Seminary, scs.edu, scs.edu. And you can find out more about St. Charles. But again, we want to get your questions and comments tonight, as well as those from our studio audience. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I, I told you about the uh, website that they have uh, at St. Charles, but there's also a St. Charles Borromeo Seminarian blog. Uh, you can go, I guess they can, people can engage the blog, yes, right? Yes, they yeah. sure can. And it's called semcasual.org, semcasual.org, and you can get on the seminary blog. I I'm too old for that stuff. <laughs> I don't blog. <laughs> but other people do. They, do. they like it. And the seminaries do a great job. Do they? They enjoy oh, it, yes. Oh, that's good. 
Also, we'd like to invite you to come down here to Sweet Home Alabama. Uh, pretty, how do you like our weather uh, it's been down great. here? Isn't we're, it pretty? We're getting ready for snow in Philadelphia. So I know. Well, um, my tulip tree in the front yard has been in blossom for over a week, oh, about 10 days by now. So uh, come on down to Sweet Home Alabama. Uh, you can contact our pilgrimage department at 205 271 2966, or you can go to the website ewtn.com. They'll give you information about the scheduling of programs. You can be in the audience masses, of course, uh, how to get to visit the sisters in Hansville and all that good stuff. You ready for some questions? Sounds good. All right, let's start off with a phone call. We have Drew. Drew, where are you calling from? Uh, hi, Father. I'm from, I'm from Philadelphia. Oh, are you? And yeah. what is your question? My question for Father Kane uh, is, I think it's very important you were talking about the human element to forming our priests, and I wanted to know, do the, pre the seminarians at, at St. Charles, do they have good senses of humor? And what's the funniest thing that, that's ever happened to you at your time at St. Charles? Now, first of all, <laughs> Drew, are you from Louisiana? No, I'm not. Oh, <laughs> I'm actually from Texas, but I live in I live in Philadelphia now. Okay, all right, good. I was going to say you didn't sound like you're from Philly. Um, <laughs> maybe East Texas. Maybe. That, that, that's a great question. I agree that, that having a sense of humor is a good part of human formation. People like a cheerful priest. One of the things that comes to mind is for our orientation at the beginning of the year, uh, we work on kind of getting everybody together. This year, we had some guys made a potato cannon, so it's it's PVC pipe that shoots a potato out and you set a, f a target out in the field. And Wait a minute, I thought you had the military <laughs> and the seminary a little more separate and distinct. We have a this. little overlap. I so, guess. Uh, so, this so. is the artillery seminary <laughs> or what? <laughs> That's right. So, so that, was, that was kind of an enjoyable thing as well as some, we had, uh, we also had. What do, you, what do you do, target mashed potato we, plates we, or we, what? We, <laughs> we set up some big targets out in the field and, uh -huh. and had a good time doing that. Had, had some of the faculty come out and do the same thing. Uh -huh. We also had, uh, what they call uh, tire bowling. You get some old tires and you roll them down the hill and you try to hit targets or, or different things at the bottom of the hill and, and people have a good time. So that's good. It's kind of fun. That's good. That's good. Also, I oftentimes use the ability of a person to laugh good naturedly at himself or herself as a quick shorthand way to indicate whether they're nuts or not. Mm -hmm. Crazy people <laughs> can't laugh at themselves. Did mm -hmm. you know that? They can't laugh at them. They take themselves too seriously. Mm -hmm. But normal people <laughs> no, yeah. have enough perspective to laugh at themselves. Mm -hmm. Ready for another question? That sounds good. Talk off with our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Well, I'm from the southwest suburb of Chicago called Elsa. Well, aren't you someone? I know we're just where that is. Big old water place. Big sign saying Alsa. And what is your question? Uh, Father, I'm a colonel of the Air Force Reserves. And I was intrigued based on your background, obviously, your military background in the Chaplain Corps and the Army. Did you experience, Father, in what I consider, or from what I consider to be probably the singularly most anti Catholic administration we may have had in the history of this country over the last eight years that just left eight, 19 days ago? and probably one of the most anti-military administrations we've ever had. Did you experience, Father, any either overt or oblique pressure uh, to compromise your beliefs among the soldiers when you were teaching about homosexuality as opposed to homosexuals, uh, it being a grave disorder, uh, given the way that the HHS and the previous administration behaved with President Obama himself, the statements that he made? Uh, the second part of my question. Well, l let, let me make sure I, I, I repeat that because the microphone isn't working real well. There, there's something wrong with it. And so, so your first question is to ask whether or not there was uh, some, you know, uh, some difficulty about uh, that you may have experienced uh, in terms of the last administration's attitude, uh, you know, strong attitude toward uh, same-sex marriage. In the sexuality yeah. itself, A, father, and same-sex marriage, B. Uh, within the military. Yes, father. Okay, so um, let's answer that part first sure, so uh, we don't get lost with the that's, question. It's, it's a great question, and, and that's a question that people ask frequently, especially of, of priests and chaplains, is, mm -hmm. is there a threat that, that we perceive to our religious freedom? And 
Thanks be to God. I enforce and, and a threat in regard to being able to teach our right. sexual morality and other areas of morality, yeah. presumably. I, thanks be to God, have never been told what I can and can't teach. And mm -hmm. one of the tenets for military chaplains is that we will never be asked to do anything that is contrary to our faith. Mm -hmm. And I have never been told what I can and can't say. And so, for example, in our RCIA classes, we are able to teach the fullness of the Catholic faith, including you know, sexual morality and, and other difficult topics, and have never felt hindered by that. I know that there has been a general unease and, and, uh, and, and questions about how do we pray and, and those kind of things, but my experience has been that, and I think that, uh, that, that it's, it's recognized as, as part of the religious freedom that, that I have not experienced being been taken away. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, that's good. Did you have a second part to that? No, oh, well, I, I think we have to go to a caller because we're still trying to get the mic fixed. So maybe we'll get you back once they fix Thank that. You. They're very good at fixing things around <laughs> here, but they don't let me touch it <laughs> because I'm completely incompetent. Let's start off with Tim. Hello, Tim. Uh, hello, Father Mitch. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Florida. Great. And your question? My, my question for uh, Father Kane is twofold. Uh, in 2003, we went to Iraq to topple Saddam Hussein and to bring democracy to Iraq. Mm -hmm. Fourteen years later, it'll be the 14th anniversary next month. Fourteen years later, we now have a president who, on the campaign trail, praised Saddam Hussein, pray, has praised and still praises, even as of this week, Vladimir Putin. And I wanted to know if any of the soldiers that Father Kane deals with come to him with reservations about what it is that they're sacrificing their lives look for, given the fickleness of our politics, yep. and relatedly, but, would he counsel any young men or young women thinking about signing up for the Army and Marines to sign up under these circumstances? Yeah, Tim, let me much. ask you this. Have you also served in the military? No, I have not. Oh, okay. So you're asking this as a, a civilian, but it's an important question. For, I, I thought maybe you'd had some background, too. Uh, but it's an important question for civilians and for the military. As politicians, uh, you know, the politics have changed from President Bush to President uh, uh, Obama, now President Trump. Um, what do the soldiers then think about taking these risks of life and limb to deal with these policies that are being fought over by the, the, the various administrations mm -hmm. and the, the, the people at large are obviously in flux as they vote in right. various politicians. How do they, what, what's their attitude on that? Here is an amazing thing that I think we also see some, we see some overlap, is that, that the members of the military have said that I am going to serve and I am going to do it in a way that involves trust. And sometimes that's a difficult thing, especially if you are not of the same political persuasion as the person who's currently in office and you are a member of the military being sent to a place that you might not necessarily even agree that, you know, why we should be there. And mm -hmm. one of the things that my grandfather, who is a World War II vet, always says, he's, he's 95 years old, but he reminds us that you learned to take care of the person next to you. You know, that mm -hmm. is what you were trying to do. And... I think that that is really a focus. That's, that's what the focus is in basic training. That's what the focus is, is you're caring for each other and you're trusting that, that somebody else who's getting paid more or who's in a different office is figuring out the diplomatic implications of, of what you're doing. And of course, you want to have meaning. And I think on a day-to-day on -day basis, you get to see, we saw in Iraq, the, the, the people who got to vote. We, we saw the humanitarian aid. We saw you know, positive things on a day-to-day -day basis that, that we were trying to have an impact on. And it can be challenging. I, I think that's one of the things that gives me an even deep, deeper respect for members of the military is, is their willingness to do that. So is it challenging? Yes. Uh, he also asked about encouraging people. Would I encourage people to join the military? You mm -hmm. know, and I think that that's a very personal decision that each person makes. They need to pray about that. Mm -hmm. But if somebody feels a, a call from God to serve in that way, in a selfless way, there is a lot of good that can come both personally and in service to our nation through service in the military. And so I, I wouldn't dissuade people, but it's, it's something that they need to talk to their family about. They need to talk to a priest, a spiritual director, and, and to figure out how all those things come together. Uh, I think, too, back in the heat of one of the earlier arguments, um, 
one of the candidates for president had said, well, the people in the, do, he challenged some college kids, do you want to be one of these guys who goes into the military implying that they were losers? And these guys are not losers. No, at you know, all. I mean, that the, is not, it. and so yeah. you've got politicians all over the place, mm -hmm. you know, on, on these issues, and, you know, and the people who make the choice to serve very much have to, you know, deal with uh, important decisions. Again, they're putting their lives, their right. families, their limbs. How many right. have lost limbs? Uh, they put that all at risk. And that's that, that. That's that idea of obedience that actually transfers directly over into the into the priesthood. Is that a priest is ordained? He puts his hands into the hands of the bishop, and he says, "I promise respect and obedience to you and your successors." And he is trusting that that bishop is going to want what's best for him and is to try to use his talents in parishes and assignments throughout that, that takes trust. On, on my way here, there was an announcement at the airport that I was flying through to military members who were passing through. And the announcement was, thank you for your courage, for your family sacrifice, and for your service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that connects to seminarians in, in the same way. The, the, the two go together. Yeah, very much so. Now we've got the microphone working because we have a wonderful crew who know what they're doing and they don't let me touch anything at all. That's why it gets back to working. So you can ask the second part of your question. Thank you, Father. It's, it's really a tangential portion of the first question, Father, and that is, as you're aware, about a year ago, the Supreme Court in five to four decision um, struck down dozens and dozens of states' uh, laws that dictated that, uh, or defined marriage as being between one man and one woman. And as a consequence of that, Chief Justice Roberts, almost without precedent, read his dissenting opinion for the bench, and I remember the, the, the punchline was that, who on earth do we think we are, uh, reading the dissent of that. But the point I, I want to ask for all of my question is, as you may be aware, West Point's now has had his first quote unquote, whatever this is, gay marriage. Um, how do you explain to the soldiers who are Catholics that the law of the land, just as abortion is the law of the land, thanks to the Supreme Court, is stating that, in fact, two men can marry one another and two women can marry one another, when the church teaches precisely the opposite? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that that really connects to how do we work in a pastoral way with people who struggle with same-sex attraction? How do we figure out that balance that Jesus challenges us to, and this is a topic that we also cover in the seminaries, is the pastoral approach to how do you love every single person and at the same time try to draw them to something closer to, to the teachings of Jesus, you know, and it's a, mm -hmm. it's a particular challenge, especially in a military setting where there is a, a, a government approval of something and the church's teaching is, is different from that. And we do training, we have opportunities to figure out how do you help everybody kind of work your way through that. One of the things that I found is that members of the military have a very high sense of respect for each other, you know, and so even though there are personal differences, there are ideological differences, mm -hmm. there are spiritual differences, that they have a respect because they recognize that we do share something else in common, kind of going back to the roots of that training that they all went through together. So. It's, it's a challenging thing. I think it's something that is not, it's not, doesn't go away, but I think the teachings of our faith give us the answer, and I think Pope Francis in particular, you know, has been challenging us in that way. We, we have to figure out, you know, he said, to live in the gray without sacrificing the truth, and yet at the same time, loving every person, even if um, the way that they're living is something that's different than what Jesus teaches us. Yeah. Let's uh, go to another caller. Hello, Margaret. Hello, Father Mitch. Hi, where are you calling from? I'm ca calling from Utica, New York. Nice, thank you. And what's your question? I wanted to know, how does the laity help increase priestly vocations? I know we can pray, but what else can we do besides pray? Oh, great question. So, uh, and for one thing, Margaret, I would want to just start off by saying, Vocations have been increasing nationwide, have they not? They have. In fact, the last two years of St. Charles, two years ago we had a 20% increase in enrollment, and this year another 15%. So yeah. that's a very positive thing. Uh, one of the things... And, and, and this is uh, around the right, country. Right, right. It's around the country, and uh, we've started to see it in my province, uh, the Jesuits 
uh, other orders are experiencing increases as well. Uh, we, we seem to have gone through some of the crises of the uh, 70s through 90s, and now there's this energy, but what does she and what do other lay people do to encourage these vocations? So here's what, here's what I found, and here's what I experienced in my own family. A comfortableness with living out the faith at home, in addition to just going to church on Sunday, finding ways to help young people interact with priests, or altar serving, uh, inviting a priest over, the, that can be challenging, going to extra things at the parish, just to make, make being around, seeing what priests do is not just standing up in the pulpit all the time. I think then an extension of that, I'm a product of Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, that can be a very helpful uh, vocation promotion. And then on the college level, we, over the Christmas break, we just took a group of seminarians to the Focus National Conference, the SEEK Conference mm -hmm. in San Antonio, Texas. What, what Focus is doing is phenomenal in, in working and evangelizing with college students. And when, st when, when people go to college, that is probably the highest place at which they fall away from their faith. And so Focus, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, is dedicated to putting missionaries out onto college campuses, helping them to study the scriptures, to be accountable to each other in poverty and excellence, in, in chastity and simplicity of life and prayer. And so that's another area too, is, is helping young people when they go to college get connected with Focus or other college ministries and Newman Centers to be able to take what they've learned in the family and then continue it through that crucial time. Another thing too that is common to a lot of men who actually take the first steps to start applying to seminary or novitiate um, if they're going into religious life is that along the way about three different people have asked that mm -hmm. young man, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you can even say, I, I don't know you real well, but you just seem to have a quality that makes me want to ask mm -hmm. if you've ever thought about being a priest. If three people, you know, when three people do that, that triggers the thought. The first one is scary. Mm -hmm. The second one is real scary. <laughs> and the third one, what's God saying? Mm -hmm. And now don't set them up. I mean, this is not some <laughs> sort of a Chicago hit job. But, you know, uh, you, you know, you can be one of those people that are, the Holy Spirit works in, Margaret. And as you sense that with somebody and just say, well, look, honey, I'm just going to pray for you. Something like that. You know, ladies can say that to guys. <laughs> and so uh, you can, you know, go ahead and just let them know, well, I just came to my mind and I'll be praying that you do what God wants you to do. You don't ram it down his throat, mm -hmm. but, and neither should parents. Right. Yeah. Neither stop them nor ram it down their throats. Right. But give but them the tools they need. Help right. them discern what God wants, not what you want. Right. And just put it on the list of possible things that we would be proud of you if, if this is what God called you to do. Yeah. Yeah. Have another question from our studio okay. audience. Sir, where are you from? Hi, I'm Armin DeToro, and I'm from North Haven, Connecticut. Great. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. And your uh, question? My question is to Father Kane. Father, you've uh, talked a lot about your experience in formation and in uh, uh, the service personnel. It's been very interesting. What role do you see as sports played in those overlaps that we've heard from you tonight? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a fun part of being at the seminary. In fact, I'm missing a basketball game tonight by being here. My... Our, uh, our, our seminary community has a basketball league, and I play on that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, I think, is an important part. So it, if they lose, it's my fault? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm sure they won. Uh, the, the idea, and going back to human formation, is that we need to have a healthy body to be able to do these other things. And so we encourage the, the men in the seminary, and we have exercise rooms and, and opportunities to, to play sports, to play soccer. We have a basketball court, access to a swimming pool. We have a soccer tournament. We actually have soccer games with other seminaries uh, and, and create a little bit of healthy competition between the seminaries each year. So that, that idea of physical fitness goes along with spiritual fitness, and those, mm -hmm. those two things play hand in hand. And, and, of course, as in the military, you know, sports are a factor in building teamwork, right? You know that's which is a very important component of sports. Uh, so that that's uh, another good thing to develop. 
um, because, you know, you wouldn't know this yet, but sometimes old priests talk about the old games they played mm -hmm. years and years ago, and they talk about it again and again with each other, you know. Mm -hmm. so that, but it's, it's not only the teamwork in the moment, but also the, the elements of, um, you know, uh, remembering those events that, are, that build up bonds because you remember sure. that, that stuff. Yeah. That, that sounds like good. Now, uh, in addition to some of these, the seminarians also are involved already in ministry projects, are they not? They are. So at St. Charles, every Thursday is dedicated to going out and working in pastoral apostolic work. So mm -hmm. they, uh, we, and, and we, we see that as a really important part of the formation process mm -hmm. that we dedicate an entire day to, to the, the apostolate work. And mm -hmm. it's great because it gives them confidence. It gives them experience. They're mentored by priests and sisters and lay people at these different apostolates and schools, prisons, nursing homes, parishes, where they learn how to build up some of their pastoral experience. You know, how do you walk into a hospital room with somebody who you know has been diagnosed with a terminal illness, and what do you say to them? You know, that, that's a really important skill to have as, as a priest, and the seminary is the place where you, you learn how to do that. How do you learn how to walk then from there to go into a kindergarten classroom and sit down and talk to them about Jesus, you know, and, and maybe do that in the same day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, that, that's oftentimes, you know, this one of the, to me, one of the most wonderful parts of the priesthood is that we get involved and we're invited into some of the most important moments of people's lives from birth and baptism all the way to, you know, the, the, the next most mm -hmm. important event, which is their death. Mm -hmm. and marriage prep and marriage crisis mm -hmm. and kids and teaching. And it's just a wide variety of things. And I think that means that the seminary formation needs to be diverse. It needs to be, it needs to be you know, something that helps them to experience all those different things. And, and it's great that, that we have the time to be able to do that. You know, we don't rush through it. You know, people will say to somebody, well, how long are you going to be in the seminary? Uh, nine years. I'm like, oh my gosh, you could be a doctor. Well, that's true. You become, <laughs> you become a doctor of souls. You know, uh, Pope Francis describes the church as the, the field hospital you right. know, where we're, we're going to care for souls. <laughs> There's an old story. This lady went to her parish priest and said, my son just joined the seminary. He said, well, which one? He said, oh, I don't know. I didn't ask. Well, if he's going to be a diocesan priest, he'll be in school for eight years. Uh, if he's a Dominican, he'll be there for 10 years. And a judge will be there for 13 years. And she said, oh, I'm sure he's going to be a judge. But he's always been a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but this, there is, it, it's not just the years of sitting in classrooms taking notes. Right. But, you know, p uh, again, our training from the bishop forward also is involved with uh, the, the process of learning ministry and making us teach two or three years in a high school mm -hmm. bef in between studying philosophy and theology uh, so that you, you test the vocation and the community tests you. Mm -hmm. You know, are you going to be lazy or are you going to work hard? Do you find that going on with the seminarians with you too, that the seminaries as much testing to see whether they should stay as they are to stay. It's true. I, I, I think that that's probably one of the more challenging parts about, about the job of the priests who are involved with formation in the seminary is similar to marriage, that both people have to agree to marriage. You can't have one who wants to really get married to somebody else who doesn't. And the church has an important obligation to figure out that the church is going to make a lifelong commitment to this man when they ordain, ordain him a priest. And we have to prayerfully consider, does he have everything that he needs to be able to serve, serve the church and to serve God's people? And right. that, that takes a lot of prayer and discernment and, and patience on the part of seminarians, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the staff. I've done that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for your double service, your service in the military and for the, our men and women who are out there, as your service as a priest and chaplain, and to our country, as well as your service to the church, not just for Philadelphia, but the church at large, because so many seminaries from other places come there.
appreciate it very much. And I'd like you to join me in blessing our audience. Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, we can bring guests like Father and so all the other guests that we have and fix the microphones and all the stuff we have to do only because this network is brought to you by you. That's how Mother Angelica set us up. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay all of our bills too. Thank you. <laughs>